When the White Star Line was acquired by the American International Mercantile Marine Company in 1902, the British Royal Navy was getting concerned that it would not have access to enough large ocean liners in the event of a war, ocean liners being considered an important component of military strategy at the time. Cunard saw an opportunity in the Royal Navy's anxiety. The company approached the Navy requesting subsidies to build two new express liners capable of at least 24.5 knots and having a large carrying capacity. The Navy agreed to provide funds if the ships would be able to meet a few additional requirements. They had to have double bottoms and watertight subdivision for safety, coal bunkers positioned so as to protect the engine rooms, and reinforced decks to support the potential installation of guns. Finally, the ships would also have to remain under British ownership. If Cunard could meet these requirements, the government would provide a low interest loan of 2.6 million pounds in addition to an annual operating subsidy of 150,000 pounds, which would prove to be important given the expense of operating ships at such a high speed. The requirements, particularly the 24.5 knot speed requirement, were stringent, but Cunard placed the order for two new ships with financial support from the government. The first ship, to be named Lusitania after the Roman province consisting of parts of modern-day Portugal and Spain, would be built on the River Clyde by the John Brown Company, while her running mate, Mauritania, named after another Roman province, would be built on the River Tyne by Swan, Hunter, and Wiggum Richardson Limited. The keel of Lusitania was laid down on August 17, 1904, in Scotland, and the keel of Mauritania was laid down the very next day in England. But the construction process of both ships was a little different than it might have been. Early on, emphasis was placed on the forward end of each ship, leaving the after ends relatively behind schedule. This is because an important decision was yet to be finalized. What type of engines would be installed on the new liners? The speed requirement of 24.5 knots mandated a lot of power, and there was an engine that could meet the demand. But it was an experimental engine which had only been proven at a much smaller scale. The Parsons steam turbine engine had been tested on a tiny vessel named Turbinia, built specifically for the purpose of testing the engine, and a few smaller liners such as the 11,000 gross registered ton Victorian. And the turbine engines had been successful on these ships, but to build two great, expensive, and critical liners around an engine system which remained untested at the scale of Lusitania and Mauritania would have been a tremendous risk for Cunard and the Navy, especially since Cunard did not have any experience with turbine-driven ships. Luckily, Cunard had two smaller, identical ships available to test the Parsons steam turbine engine. Those ships, though, would not be completed until the end of 1905, and so the builders of Lusitania and Mauritania were stalling. Eventually, those two ships, Carmania and Caronia, were completed and put to sea, and it soon became clear that the Parsons steam turbine engine did work at the scale of a large ocean liner, and it allowed for faster speeds, without higher fuel consumption. In this case, it allowed Carmania, the ship with the steam turbine engine, to cruise at a full knot faster than Caronia, the ship equipped with a conventional quadruple expansion engine. In the case of Lusitania and Mauritania, it would certainly allow the ships to meet their 24.5 knot speed requirement. Construction on the after end could proceed, and gradually the ships came to life as the one inch thick hull plating was riveted to the frame, revealing the classic tumble home which had been incorporated into the ship's design. Tumble home is the slanting of the hull outward as it approaches the waterline, which improves stability and gives ships a traditional aesthetic. Lusitania was launched first in June 1906. She had a three month head start on her sister, which was launched in September of 1906. For the next year plus, the incomplete shells of the ships were fitted with their engines and boilers, interiors, funnels, and rigging. Even if the ships were being completed side by side, it would have taken a keen eye to spot the differences between the two. But there were a few. Mauritania had a rounded stern, as opposed to Lusitania's more square stern. This added about 5 feet to her overall length, making Mauritania the longer ship. She was also the larger ship. At 31,938 gross registered tons, Mauritania was about 400 tons larger than her sister. Lusitania's ventilators were of a more discreet, hinge-top design, which gave her a cleaner look than her sister, but Lusitania's ventilators were not as well suited for the harsh Atlantic as the traditional cowl ventilators of Mauritania, and they had to be replaced frequently. Beneath the waterline, Mauritania drew an additional 1.5 inches on her sister, and was equipped with four-bladed propellers rather than three-bladed propellers like her sister. The four-bladed propellers would later prove to be more efficient and ultimately allow Mauritania to capture the blue ribbon from her sister as soon as she was given the chance. 
The most notable distinction between the two sisters, though, would not be apparent to the public until both ships were in service. Although the layout was more or less the same, the interior design differed substantially between the ships, which would create a unique atmosphere aboard each one. Lusitania's interior was designed by James Millar and was based on the Georgian and Louis XVI styles. There was a lot of white with gold trim and a general lightness to the public rooms of the ship. Mauritania's interiors, on the other hand, were designed by Harland Pato, who was possibly inspired by the interior design of Hamburg America's ship, SS America. Mauritania had a darker tone, with plentiful oak and mahogany being used. Lusitania was completed in the summer of 1907. On her builder's trial, it was confirmed that Lusitania would meet the speed requirements of Cunard and the Royal Navy, but that speed came at a price. At high speed, the after end of the ship in particular vibrated excessively, to the point where certain areas of the ship would be practically uninhabitable. So Lusitania returned to Clydebank, where modifications were made before the official trials and handing off to Cunard. Most notably, some of the public second-class rooms were reinforced with beams and arches to stiffen that section of the ship. These modifications reduced the appeal of the rooms affected, and only moderately reduced vibration. Lusitania's official sea trials in 1907, though, were a tremendous success. Producing 70,000 horsepowers at full steam, the ship at times exceeded 26 knots, surpassing the requirement of 24.5 knots by a significant margin. Needless to say, Cunard accepted Lusitania the next month, and in September, Lusitania sailed from Liverpool on her maiden voyage with 200,000 spectators wishing her bon voyage from the shore. The first voyage, though, was not necessarily as glorious as her owners might have hoped. The voyage was dampened by pesky fog, and despite being the fastest ship in the world, she arrived off Sandy Hook 32 minutes shy of the speed record. Lusitania's arrival in New York was still met with praise and enthusiasm from the public. She was both the fastest and the largest ship in the world, and was a spectacle in every way. Yet, she would only bask in this glory for as long as she lacked a sibling. Mauritania was not without her own problems, though. Around the time of her older sister's maiden voyage, her builders took her to sea for her preliminary trials. They discovered vibration problems of similar magnitude to those of Lusitania, but at the forward superstructure rather than the stern. During a high-speed run, the commander ordered the engine slowed. Later, when he was asked why, he said, because I was being shaken off my bridge. Mauritania went back in for renovations, and fortunately did not require quite as much modification as her sister. Between Mauritania's later official trials and her maiden voyage, Lusitania was able to capture the blue ribbon from the Germans, and became known as a four-day boat, meaning that she could make a crossing in less than five days. The first leg of Mauritania's voyage from Liverpool in November 1907 was less successful than that of Lusitania. She battled strong westerlies, and although she powered through them with steadfast speed, she pitched and rolled uncomfortably in doing so. At one point, a wave broke free a spare anchor on the bow, and the ship had to heave to, in other words, slow down and head into the wind, so that the crew could secure the anchor. It took 24 minutes and killed whatever hope remained for a record maiden crossing. This hindrance did not hold Mauritania back for long, though. On her return crossing from New York, Mauritania did beat Lusitania's eastbound record and so marked the beginning of a fierce sibling rivalry. The Blue Ribbon would change hands between the two ships a few times, with Lusitania firmly holding onto the westbound record, and Mauritania the eastbound record. Eventually, though, Mauritania took the Blue Ribbon from her sister once and for all, and she would hold on to that coveted, if intangible, prize for 20 more years, somehow keeping it out of reach of newer liners until the Bremen came along in 1929. Lusitania and Mauritania would go on to earn a reputation for speed and reliability, two critical characteristics of a successful express liner. One of the trade-offs, though, was that they were not always the most comfortable, despite their fine finishings and amenities. They were long and narrow, so they pitched and rolled more than other ships. Their bows were also designed to plow through waves rather than ride over them, which allowed for greater speed in rough conditions, but also wet conditions on board and the occasional bad run-in with a rogue wave. Nonetheless, both ships were remarkably popular. Not equally popular, though. Despite being the less revered ship in hindsight, Lusitania was the more popular ship among passengers of the day. It might be fair to assume that this was due to the different interiors, since this is what would have been most noticeable for passengers. Perhaps the lighter and airier decor was more popular with the ladies, who often made the travel arrangements. Cunard's dual express liner service across the Atlantic, though, was missing something. A third ship. Despite all their speed and reliability, a third ship was still necessary in order to offer a weekly service between Liverpool and New York. Cunard's solution was the Aquitania, a much larger ship, more in line with White Star Line's Olympic class. 
Aquitania would be much more comfortable and luxurious than Lusitania and Mauritania, but her 24 knot service speed would be sufficient for her to keep up with the demanding schedule. But Aquitania would not enter service until June 1914. Not only did this leave Lusitania and Mauritania without a proper running mate for seven years, but the long-awaited establishment of a three-ship express service coincided with the outbreak of World War I two months later. The moment the British Admiralty had been waiting for was finally here. Merchant ships, including the specially built Lusitania and Mauritania, could finally be put to the test as armed merchant cruisers. It quickly became apparent, though, that the large merchant ships did not make good warships. Ships other than Lusitania and Mauritania had demonstrated that the conceptual armed merchant cruiser was awkward, expensive, and limited in range. The Admiralty almost immediately abandoned the idea of using liners as warships, but it had already pressed Mauritania into service, and so she sat empty and idle, her fine finishings removed, awaiting a decision as to her potential utility. Meanwhile, Lusitania continued her transatlantic service, her schedule reduced to one round-trip voyage per month, and six of her boilers were taken offline, reducing her service speed to 21 knots in the name of saving fuel. But she remained the fastest liner on the England to New York route. Lusitania's speed was thought to be the best defense against Germany's new naval weapon of choice, the U-boat. Initially, her status as an unarmed passenger ship was thought to have added a layer of protection, but several British merchant ships had been sunk by German U-boats since the war began. Germany had begun placing ads in American newspapers, warning citizens of the neutral United States that it would be dangerous to travel on ships of belligerent nations. One of these warnings appeared directly adjacent to an advertisement for Lusitania's May 1, 1914 eastbound crossing from New York to Liverpool. The warning served as a reminder that a state of war existed between Britain and Germany, and that any civilians who sailed aboard a British ship did so at their own risk. But when Lusitania departed New York, she was as full as she had been on any other wartime crossing, and the passenger list included many Americans. Some had heeded the warning of the newspaper that day, and cancelled in favor of the departure of an old American line ship, New York, which was only a few hours later. But most stuck to their original plans, mostly made months in advance. This particular voyage of Lusitania was notably asocial for a transatlantic crossing. But on the morning of the scheduled arrival in Liverpool, passengers were dressed up and giddy with anticipation of arriving ashore. But this was the most dangerous part of the voyage. The Irish coast appeared on the horizon. Captain William Turner was aware that 12 Allied ships had been sunk by German U-boats since Lusitania's departure from New York, and that submarine activity had been reported off Fastnet, the waters the ship was now entering. As a precaution, he had 22 lifeboats swung out so that they could be launched more quickly if necessary. But Turner continued on, actually at a reduced speed due to some patchy fog, and closer to shore than would have been optimal for safety from U-boats. As many passengers were enjoying lunch, some passengers were on deck to spot the torpedo racing toward the ship. It struck at 1410. After a rapid and violent sinking, the ship was gone within 18 minutes. 1,195 were lost including 123 Americans, whose deaths contributed to the intensifying political climate in the United States, which eventually allowed it to join the war. As her sister was sinking, Mauritania was carrying her first load of troops to the war front at Gallipoli. The Admiralty had since found a use for her and all the requisitioned merchant ships. Instead of asking them to perform a task for which they were never designed, fighting, they were asked to do exactly what they were intended for carry huge numbers of people swiftly and efficiently. And Mauritania carried out this role effectively, transporting over 50,000 troops over the course of the war. She also briefly served as a hospital ship during the Gallipoli campaign. Her officers were also effective in keeping the great ship safe during the war, the ship not having suffered any major damage during the dangerous time. One of her captains, David Dow, even saved Mauritania from suffering the same fate as her sister when he spotted the telltale sign of a torpedo, ordered the helm hard to port, and avoided a fatal blow. Having made it to the end of the war, Mauritania returned to her rightful owner, Cunard, and re-entered passenger service in March 1920. But she was not her old self. On her first commercial voyage since the war, Mauritania averaged 17.81 knots, pitiful given her potential. The war had taken its toll, and Mauritania needed work, but Cunard was desperate for revenue by this time. Even though Mauritania's reputation was in decline, it took a fire in first class to force Cunard to pull the ship from service, at which point they took the opportunity to convert her from a coal-burning ship to an oil-burning ship. This improved her speed, but did not return her to her former glory. Her turbine engines were old and tired, and badly needed an overhaul. 
Work on the turbines was almost complete when the English workers went on strike, forcing Cunard to use French labor to complete the task. Moving the ship with the engines disassembled, though, would be no easy task. Under the command of Captain Arthur Rostron, famous for his role in rescuing the Titanic survivors in 1912, Mauritania made her way across the English Channel for Cherbourg, France, under tow by six Dutch tugboats. At one point, the wind shifted unexpectedly, and the tugs were overpowered, sending Mauritania slowly drifting backwards toward the rocky shore. The entire ship could have been lost, but Captain Rostron was confident that the tide would turn just in time to avert a financial disaster, and he was right. With the work on her engines complete, Mauritania returned to service for what may be considered the best years of her life. Much of this time was spent under the command of Captain Arthur Rostron, who was now one of the most senior captains of Cunard and would soon be the line's commodore. The fact that Rostron had command of Mauritania said as much about Mauritania as it did about Rostron. Mauritania's original running mate, Lusitania, was gone. But now she had Aquitania, and Cunard had received Hamburg America's massive liner, Imperator, as a reparation, which they renamed Berengaria. Mauritania, Aquitania, and Berengaria were a formidable trio on the express route between Southampton and New York. Mauritania even broke her own pre-war speed record when she crossed the Atlantic eastbound at an average speed of 26.25 knots, capturing the blue ribbon from herself. Captain Arthur Rostron details this remarkable late career speed record in his autobiography. He coordinated with the chief engineer at the start of the voyage. They were going for the record, but it was kept under wraps because anything could have happened, and perhaps Rostron, known to personify his favorite ships, wanted to save Mauritania from any embarrassment. But many of you are probably familiar with the betting that occurred among passengers as to the distance traveled over a given day at sea. To allow for this, daily mileage was made available by the officers to the passengers. Day one was a record. The wind was calm and the sea smooth. Day two was a record. And by day three, passengers were paying attention. One passenger even asked Rostron over dinner if he was going for the speed record. Tight-lipped, Rostron denied it and just said, oh no, just out to do our best, that's all. Cunard had always been coy about record-breaking ambitions, so as not to appear reckless or unprofessional. Needless to say, Rostron got his speed record, and that was the record that stayed on the books until Bremen finally snatched the blue ribbon from Mauritania after all those years. Even when she was past her prime, Mauritania was famously beloved by the public. U.S. President Franklin Delano Roosevelt spoke of Mauritania in a way that few ships are spoken about. He described her as having a soul. He said, quote, Not for one minute did I ever fail to realize that if there was ever a ship which possessed the thing called soul, the Mauritania did. Every ship has a soul, but the Mauritania had one you could talk to. In 1926, Mauritania underwent a major renovation, which refurbished the public rooms, 100 staterooms, and installed additional private bathrooms, an amenity that the public had come to expect more of in the years since Mauritania's construction. But after the market crash of 1929, the weakened economy and the diminished passenger traffic, in addition to new competition in the form of new and modern ships on the Atlantic, reduced Mauritania's profitability. Cunard was forced to send Mauritania on more and more cruising voyages taking Europeans to the Mediterranean and Americans to the Caribbean for part of the year. Eventually, she was repainted white so that she would be better suited for what was becoming her primary role in tropical waters. She was even reduced to taking Americans on so-called booze cruises, which brought Americans far enough away from American shores so that they could evade prohibition laws, although the Americans might have considered this to be a noble cause indeed. These endeavors kept Mauritania in service. But eventually, she was just too outdated to compete in the market of large passenger liners. She was withdrawn from service in September 1934 and laid up in Southampton, where she rested for nearly a year before having her furnishings auctioned off, and she was sold for scrap in July 1935. It was a sad and nostalgic moment for many of her former passengers and crew, but it was also sad even for the public at large who adored what was one of the most iconic ocean liners ever conceived. Captain Arthur Rostron, perhaps Mauritania's most ardent supporter, saw the ship off, but would not board her, later writing in his memoirs that he preferred to remember her as she was in her best days.